good afternoon, everyone. We are, this is the final countdown to home time. You can just stick with it a bit longer. Um, so I'm delighted to be talking about shared leadership. Um, and I'm just going to give you, this is the tour of what will hopefully be the fastest presentation ever, but I'm going to just have a set the scene um, for my study. The, my study's focus is up at the top. So I'm looking at the practice and the processes and the relationality which is informing shared leadership at a housing association where I have uh, had the privilege of having some very unique access. But I have a particular focus. It's not, my focus is not primarily on the senior leadership. It's, it's uh, the focus is on rather the followers or those staff who are working in relation to their senior leaders. So the tour, I'm about to take you on a very fast tour. You won't be stopping the breaks. Um, I'll set out what's unique about this research environment. Why, you know, why has it been a special place to go and explore? The gap or gaps in the literature that I'm uh, seeking to uh, investigate via the site. But I'm also going to set it out uh, because my focus here today was on methodology. And uh, I wanted to just take a quick stop and look at action research and in particular learning histories which has been a wonderful new revelation uh, to me as a way of capturing data differently um, and then hopefully just give you a little insight into how the learning history has been approached and it's not organized at all i thought i should have changed that slide how it's currently being organized so let's um <laughs> under promise and over deliver um anyway so the unique context <coughs> I can go to the next slide. How does this work? Please or Jill? It's just up there. Where do I point? <laughs> Turn <Trum> roll. <laughs> so, so exciting. Wait till I send this next slide. Honestly. <laughs> no, really. <laughs> any any Jill? Actually, I've got one in my bag. I get extra time. Just tell us what's unique about oh, it. Oh, it's a beautiful slide for me. Look, basically, um, this particular organisation back in 2011 had a wellbeing audit. They produced a wellbeing audit for staff. And it, uh, they discovered some really poor findings in terms of staff morale, general performance. And as a result, the, the chief executive who was then in place she decided, she took a strategic decision in concert with her other senior leaders. She said, we are now going to, um, we're going to engage in a process whereby we seek to share leadership. Um, and they described it in terms of different processes and practices that they were going to engage in, in order to improve decision making, improve morale, and ultimately improve organization performance. So that was back in 2011. Roll forward to 2018, and between uh, last November 2017 and uh, this summer, well, just literally uh, last Monday, Monday a week ago, I was completing my fifth and final workshop with a group of volunteers who, in 2017, in March 2017, had been invited, like as they had been invited to volunteer to co create strategy for this organization. So, over a year, they've been co creating strategy and have produced a strategic vision across a range of different themes to 2023. Now they were directly involved in the process, it's quite an important point. Look at that slide, is that not, you've just been waiting for that all your life. No, anyway, so that context. That's one of their little illustrations from one of our, um, from one of our workshops as well, because um, we use different methods. Oh, thank you very much, sir. Right, so basically, these volunteers have been co-creating strategy in concert, in collaboration with their senior leaders and ultimately with their board. And I think, if you like, walking alongside in parallel, trying to track the journey with them. So as they've been doing something, they've come out and we've been conducting action inquiry together to say, what's happened? What's it been like? And there are reasons for that. Give you a chance to just read that. Focus my study in the top paragraph. So, in a nutshell, typically shared leadership looks at um, 
team effectiveness, and usually in relation to performance. But actually, the process, what actually happened in, in terms of those who were involved in the process, there's, um, it's, it's less well understood in that way. And so what we decided to do with this group who were co-creating strategy was to, if you like, if we could understand what was involved in shared leadership, how could we make it better? What, you know, could we then evaluate for this organisational context primarily and principally about what works, what doesn't work, and improve its practice more widely as a, as a practice within an organisation? That's what we've been setting out to do. This sweet diagram is, um, I'll give you the chance, this is the, 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 the definition, one of the core definitions of shared leadership. And the key thing here is about influence, but it's an influence that doesn't just go downwards from senior leadership down, it emanates upwards or across horizontally in order to achieve group or organisational goals. But what you see in this V diagram down here in bottom is this big, uh, well, it's a black box, but a, it's actually, it's the box which says we don't really know what happens in there. What you normally get in studies is you get a good idea of, you see point A, you'll get antecedents or conditions which are supposedly meant to uh, be favourable to shared leadership. That might be certain group characteristics or competencies that people have, or maybe the environment, say, hey, we're, we're involved in high tech or we're a creative advertising agency. So we need to be collaborative or, or what have you as an illustration. And then you look at the outcomes in B, which are team effectiveness or improved organisational performance. In the middle, using conventional um, uh, method, you know, conventional modes of analysis, you'll usually study discrete variables, so the behaviours of the doings of leadership. And you'll get, you get a sense in the studies of how and, and whether those involved think that contributes to effectiveness. What you don't get a sense of is what happened. Was leadership actually shared? Uh, and by who and where? And you also normally, in this arena, in the in shared leadership studies, you, you also don't get a sense of context. And um, one of its theoretical cousins, distributed leadership, does actually address that contextual issue uh, more fully. And also, interestingly, in distributed leadership, you also get a sense of some of the practice or what does this stuff look like in practice in an organisation. So what I'm saying is one of my key positions is shared leadership. It sits within a plethora of often, you know, um, interchangeably used terms for pluralistic forms of leadership. And if you like, in the age we live in, with the kind of complex issues we have, particularly in the social sector, you are, this, this kind of, this kind of focus or um, focus on greater collaboration and devolved leadership seems to be the, um, the silver bullet or the thing that's going to solve all of our organizational problems. <clears throat> so that's sort of some of the background on that. Followership is another important theoretical um, idea. You can't have leadership without followership or it's something, it becomes something else. Maybe it becomes teamwork or collaboration, but basically we're talking about a basic power asymmetry. You don't have a, a follower without a leader um, actually, you, you probably can have uh, um, followers, but uh, who are not necessarily um, working in harmony with the leader. There have been many, many studies in that regard. But followership is an interesting uh, theoretical uh, concept that I wanted to look at, which is hence why I chose, or I was lucky enough to have the opportunity to look at a, a group of staff, necessarily or managers, but they, they volunteered, they stepped up to the leadership challenge. The other thing about followership is if you look, Mary Ulbeen, who's a writer on relational leadership, she's, she did a review in 2014, and it was about 14% of the publications in the leadership quarterly, they were on followership, 14%. That's not great innings when it comes to the voice of others. So looking at uh, trying to engage in a study, which if you like reverses the lens, but we're not thinking about the, the, the focus being on top down, which is where a lot of shared leadership studies focus their attention on the senior leaders and looking at, well, actually, let's reverse the lens and see what happens when your staff are given a voice and give, give expression to this issue, which is what we can do. So we're looking at the processual nature of shared leadership. When I did a, um, a quick 
uh, word search in ethos. So if you're not hooked up to ethos, you've got to, but it's got all the UK PhDs. <coughs> when I looked at, I did a, a word search and I did shared leadership, a process. Do you know how many dissertations came up? One, and it's yours. One, I can, yeah, sitting in this room. So that's really quite interesting um, of itself. Anyway, but I'm looking at the, the process or the social process, how, how, where it's happening or not. And actually, how is it operationalized and practiced? And then another source of knowledge or knowing is, if you like, um, the actual felt lived experience. So what is it like? This, is a, this thing, this body we, we wander around in, is a source of knowing, according to some researchers. And um, looking at it, particularly in the context of sharing leadership with peers and sharing it upwards in the organisation. And now on to action research. That's what the definition is of action research. So just a few things that I found very stimulating about action research. Basically, the focus here is not exclusively on propositional knowledge and making a theory, to act, making a contribution to theory. Not exclusively, it doesn't discard it. But the major focus of action research is about making practical things happen, people, enabling people to address things that they want to change in their lives collaboratively. So it's democratic, it's participative, it has its roots in activism. So that's quite interesting, Solodinsky and, and, and the like. So there's no surprises there. And particularly the groups who traditionally may not have had a, a voice. And there are varying forms of it. But that's what excited me about this. This is something we can use, research that has a practical application afterwards. Key thing, just um, epistemologically, and this is how we've organised the uh, learning history. We have looked at um, basically the experience of people as they've been learning how to create a strategy for the first time, but working with, with colleagues and, and with their senior leaders, etc. Together, we've been, uh, we have created, if you like, it's informed presentational knowing. And what that means is we've been creating a learning history, which is stories, it's video, it's images, it's illustrations. So if you like, if you think of a case study with its generalised um, generalized and perhaps best practice uh, uh, description, this action research uh, learning history that we're creating um, is, has that multimedia approach. It's polyvocal, but it also just, it, it focuses on the thinking and the approach of why people did what they did. So it's helping you get to terms with the real experience of how we got to where we're going. This obviously in turn involves propositional knowing, and then it gives us the chance to, if you like, articulate the desired future we want, and we have a lot of learning to inform how we reach that future. That's the logic of it. Um, and Heron talks about the three, your research statements informing your presentational knowing and also your propositional knowing. It's an interactive process. So while we're building this story between myself and the participants, we are checking facts, we're looking for themes, we're going in, we're, we're adding all the time youth based on reflection and dialogue. They're all, they're all the principles in a nutshell. There's the learning history. Um, we're creating, and the key thing here is for, for us to look at, when we have this artifact, so creating learning history, it's a process and it's an artifact. And when we, as we're doing this, we are learning from what's happened from events recently and getting further evaluations from, as a result of, you know, thinking on the topic, but in order to improve that practice more widely. And I just want to finish with a quote just to sort of try and bring this to life, because I haven't had time to go through the website we've been co-creating. I won't burst into song. Right, so it's just, if you imagine, see, this is the very, this is 2017, it's March. It's like people like yourself in a room who have never, you know, been involved in creating strategy. The chief executive just drops 
drops down the sort of black canvas on the floor and says, now, over to you. And everyone's like standing there going, wow, what? Because they have to take up the mantle and start creating the strategy. And this is just some um, experiences, just two short ones. The positive side that day was that we got to set the agenda. And one of the things we sort of talked about was, you might go to a staff conference, you know, and you'd be shoehorned into something like a workshop and think, well, I might be able to talk a little bit about that. But here you could be really specific. I really want to talk about this specific thing. And you were then joined by people who were interested in that topic. You could talk it through properly instead of trying to be shoehorned or fit it in with someone else's agenda. That was one. And then one other experience yeah, was an experience of actually being able to express what they thought about this organisation. I think it was the venting part, so people expressing emotionally. There was a chance there, and you don't get that at some events. You get shut down, and it's no negativity. Well, I was in a room where there were a number of senior managers, and there were people there, and they said, come on, let's hear everything. Let's have it out. That's quite refreshing. Thank you. And now we are doing this, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm very fascinated with what you have to say about shared leadership. And uh, so you're looking, very ambitious project, a uh, very ambitious research project. You're looking at shared leadership in situ as it is happening through the processes, practices and the relationships that are unfolding. And, you know, who's making what, how is it happening, the actual thing, the nitty gritty and not just uh, what we see later on and, you know, what is later up, written up um, in documents, etc. So that's fascinating and you're using this learning histories approach for, um, um, you know, untangling some of the processes, the artifacts, etc. And, uh, you know, how meaning is made of this process of leadership happening between groups of people. Correct. Yeah. Correct. So very, very, very fascinating. I mean, I, I'm just, I just want to look at the website and uh, you know, look at how they're doing it and everything. And then, and, and then, how did you manage to walk those parallel paths and get to speak to them after the event and uh, this day? Because there's a lot of sensitivities involved. Oh, seriously, yeah. So how did you capture it all? So if something of that, if you could reflect on your own experience. So, I mean, one of the things, and I have been toying with it, particularly with the supervisory team, it's been, what's my position here? Because in this type of research, your objectivity collapses, and you're trying to, at best, become critically subjective with others. So our, our you know, who we are, what we bring to our understanding of what even leadership is, is affected by us. So, um, I, decided, I, I, I wasn't going to look at it uh, for my own self-development as a leadership, um, uh, the leadership practitioner. It wasn't quite the right fit, so the second person was more important. And to be invited with, but with a deep interest in how we lead, because that's my day job, that's what I do in executive education. But, um, so looking at, so it was their work, and using my skills as a facilitator to try and if you like, draw out different experiences, so create different sort of reflective spaces, if you like, after the fact, for people to come into over a series of timed workshops that would work in parallel with the events as they were unfolding. This organisation is, um, uh, is, is, is well regarded in terms of its um, uh, people development, so I had a good and, yeah, if you like, a, a positive audience who were, were willing to give me access for that reason, they're very, very positive about being a learning organization because they could see if they could have their, if they could have the history tracked, that would give them material to, to think about which would influence further policy. So that, that's the logic. The, the other tricky thing is it's a local solution. So primarily we're looking at these folk wanting to work this, work better and develop this practice within their organization. It's within a housing sector, which also, because of my extensive work 
in the public sector. I know how UK public sector organisations typically, you know, work in general. We know that they operate in hierarchies. And um, these words like shared leadership and collaborative leadership are often more espoused than perhaps the reality because people are more functional and, and you know, adhere to their role. So to see this difference, it was another unique thing. And wouldn't that be great to share? If you could sort of see, if people could share their experience and what they've learned within their sector, that, that, would, be, um, that would be useful. Thank you. Uh, does everyone to ask questions? Yeah. Okay, um, what I understand from your explanation is um, your approach to set more of co-creation between you and subject and object. You bet. Um, and uh, you are probably trained, um, you are trained researcher when core researchers are trained. How do you manage to um, uh, like create reality or co-create this research with people that probably might not have the necessary background into research and uh, yeah. So there's been a lot of briefings. So when we, prior to, to the, the kickoff of the project, people had to be um, fully briefed as to what were, what were the objectives of the study. So they know then broadly what we're looking for. And, and then the question, and quite importantly, was do you wish to participate? You're not, you're not mandated. This had to be voluntary on, their, on the people concerned. And I had about 15 people sign up. So that's quite important. So they, they needed to know the premise of what the question was. And then when we came in, there were various, there are various um, techniques that you can use in order to track, if you like, key moments on a journey, which are used in business and change process consultancy. But that's the sort of starting point. Margaret Gerty talks about, so you take maybe someone's experience on that journey, you then can add your reflection to it, but you've got to bring it back. It's not, I'm not then have the final say on, oh, I think you said, and will we just frame it that way? Because that would be diminishing and also would be, I would be, I would have the superior voice, if that makes sense. So you bring it back. So you're constantly, it's a bit like making a film. So sometimes when you go through, um, and you've used that curating process, but you, you, you want to set out the scenes for people and then you get their take on it and go, oh, no, no, that didn't happen in that order. Or, you know, this more, so they will give their sense of that and then you will, raise the game and say, but let's reflect, so what? So what, what are we learning from this? I, we're not just going in to create a description, although that should, in and of itself is an interesting thing to do, but it's, it, you've got to bring it back. You have to have more dialogue, then we, we write up what the reflections are. So it's kind of a process. It's very iterative, highly iterative, yeah. Makes you quite crazy. <laughs> Just methodologically, you, you're acting as a facilitator, so you're enabling to a certain extent the learning history and action research. Could an organisation actually do it for themselves? Could they conduct the, the action research themselves and create a learning history themselves without the independence? of you as a facilitator? They, they, they certainly can and have done. I mean, in fact, many of the, um, well, it, there are, so there are various forms of action research. There's a whole family. So one is called cooperative inquiry. The other one is called um, um, action inquiry. So yes, they can. The, the contribution or where, where it's been complementary, these are all practitioners. Yeah. I've been able to dig around in the literature and say, oh, there's some really interesting questions being raised by, say, this, this particular area of relational theory, which maybe posits certain things. So you can you can add that flavor. So, but you don't necessarily um, somewhere the propositional though, and some of that those concepts would be used to test what's going on. So you know, social workers would have their propositional knowing that, that they would work with. There's no reason, and lots of lots of folk have in all sorts of different settings. Interestingly, it helps a lot. Yeah. But if that answers your question, yeah. Yeah. Mm. going yeah. once, yeah. going twice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? I'd like to say thanks very much.